today I'm really, really excited to talk about dream work. Okay. Okay. So are we going now? Yeah. This okay. is us going. Yeah. So, okay. um, I usually already introduce you in the show, but I'll say again, it's such a pleasure to have you here with me and our community. And last night we had an amazing event here where you, um, gave an impeccable evening talk to 19 people. And for our small community, that's a big deal. It was hard to get 19 people to come to a workshop in Duncan. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's a really dedicated crew of people here um, showing up for these different events that we offer. But last night on the eve of the eclipse to gather and talk about astrology, you know, the spirit of our times, where the planets are right now, the impact of, you know, what is happening right now astrologically as well as what's to come right um was really really profound and you have a youtube channel healer and dreamer astrology astrology on youtube where you actually are continually updating the viewers um i have with... a number of playlists on there okay. i have a, a, a new moon a full moon called soul e luna um inspiration so that's to keep track of the lunations and what's going on then i have a monthly forecast playlist and then i have long view uh two podcast two uh, series of the long view i have uh, the astrology of the great reset mm. which looks at uh wtf just happened um and uh, also I'm working on <clears throat> uh, the Triad of Transformation, which is the upcoming alignments that we're going to see in 2025, 2026, and beyond, and the meaning of our times, and how to uh, prepare and make the best out of it. Mm -hmm. So that's my astrological work, but yeah. you're interested in the dream stuff. Today, yeah, no? yeah. And so before we get into dream work, I just wanted to let people know that that's, you know, where they can find the astrology work and um, that there's some really potent teachings that you share in, in on your channel and in that work and that we got to experience that in person last night and that was such a gift. So thanks for being here and this is a another kind of version of us connecting. <laughs> well, uh, for the folks who are tuning in, because I'll put this on my channel as well. Mm. And uh, so uh, I'm uh, with uh, my dear friend, Deandra, um, who, um, Toussignan, uh, do you still go with that? Mm -hmm. Um, who, um, we've known for many, many years, um, and who lives in Anol. On Anol. On Anol. On Anol in Manitoba, next to the great park of? Uh, Riding Mountain National Park. Riding Mountain National Park. So I'm halfway across the country. Uh, I made it across the prairies and I'm in Manitoba and we'll be here for a few days. And so thanks for tuning in. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a, I love um, the concept of uh, um, cross pollination yeah. where, you know, through multiple platforms and to co-create with others, the dialogue, the, you know, and so you have um, Deandra as what's your name of your podcast? I have my reasons. I have my reasons. Very nice. So check out uh, Deandra's work. Uh, I have my reasons wherever you find podcasts. That's <laughs> just a different world for me. I just stay with YouTube. I'm low tech, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for moving into the high tech space with the microphones like this and the camera and all these things, you know. So thanks. I'm so intimidated. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Tim, for all the stuff. Um, yes, Tim, yeah, you're the yeah. man. <laughs> um, so what a gift, you know, we, we talked about this years ago about you making it here in person and we've done work together. You've mentored me in dream work and, you know, astrology, you've done readings with me, um, in Jungian psychology and that continues, you know, it just is getting more frequent and, uh, deeper and having you here at this kind of midpoint, it feels like is really Really I special. think we're just getting started. Although we've been known, we've known each other for over 10 years and we've been influences in each other's lives. I think that um, seems, well, you know, just to put ourselves astrologically, we're doing this uh, podcast 
right on the eclipse. Yeah. Like exactly. So there's a lot of power here. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want it any other way. <laughs> oh, so I guess I just want to say dream work has been my first dream work I ever did was with you. Um, okay. And it's been such a profound experience for me personally in understanding my unconscious and really being able to look at my psyche in right. a way that is outside of this like rational thinking kind of machine that has been created through psychotherapy. And, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about this, that we can get really caught up in the narratives and the stories. Um, and that doesn't always actually get us to these shadowy parts of ourselves to the unconscious to really, um, connect with our soul. Right. 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 And so that's where dream work for me has come in in, in sparking that deeper work. Right. Yeah. And, and the mystery of dream work and the adventure of dream work is so amazing. You know, that's my experience of it, that I, I find that work really fruitful, but also there's an exciting element to it because um, it's actually just coming from you. So there's this like uh, mythopoetic piece of it, the symbology, the, the fact that it's actually just your soul, your, yourself generating this um, play. Yeah. Um, it's huge, really, dream analysis. Uh, and, you know, I came to dream analysis and to Jung kind of through the back door, I say, um, you know, where I became an astrologer first. And in the astrology practice, you know, I have, you know, 25 years of studies in astrology before I, I even started doing readings. And then when I started doing readings, I realized, oh, you have to educate yourself uh, more as to what happens in a, in a psychological setting. So then I proceeded to just devour all of Jung's work. And then that's when... Through reading Jung's work, I started integrating dream practice. And, of course, dream analysis has been uh, with us for thousands of years. Uh, there's many instances um, in the Bible about dream analysis. There's uh, um, all kinds of, of uh, you know, in, in native tribes, the shamans and the... In, and the, and the uh, the chiefs would be guided by their dreams, you know, and they wake up after a dream and they say, okay, it's time to move to camp. And, and so, and the, there's a, there's a word for it too, huh? It's called oneiromancy and oneocrypt. An oneocrypt is someone who reads dreams and oneoromancy is the art of telling the future by studying people's dreams. Wow. So those are the fun things that you learn when you read Jung. So, so Jung took dream analysis and actually it was Freud that got him on to it. So in 1900 to the minute, Freud came with the book called On Dream and, uh, uh, um, On Dreams or something like that. Uh, so the first, you know, psychotherapeutical book written about dream work was Freud in 1900, and Jung got a hold of it in 1901. And then in 1905, after his education, he, he became a psychiatrist, and he moved into um, Bergozi Mental Hospital under the care of Eugene Bluler, uh, and that was the hot spot for psychotherapy in the modern world. Um, uh, Eugene Bluler was like, uh, you know, a long lineage of early psychiatrists in Europe, uh, uh, in Zurich, Switzerland, this uh, institution. And what made Jung famous is that he was doing dream analysis with this with this, with this, you know, with the psychologically broken people, and he would teach them how to work with their dreams, 
And by the time they would get to understand what their dreams were saying, it would release him from the hospital as cured. Mm -hmm. So, and he, and then he developed the, um, the association test and did the early, you know, the association test we still use in criminology now. And it's how, it, it, it's a series of questions uh, that you ask the, cl the client and you monitor the reaction and you isolate the psychological complexes. So then Jung saw that in dream analysis, the complexes would be given form so that the unconscious would speak to your neurosis and to your psychological difficulties. So then, then, then dragging O'Neill Romancy out of the closet by Freud's lead, he became um, a dream analyst in his practice. Jung analyzed 90,000 dreams and um, over 60 years. And uh, in 1909 or so, uh, Jung and Freud went to the States together on a ship and then they analyzed each other's dreams all the way there and all the way back. And so dream analysis is foundational to modern psychology and it's the most powerful dream, uh, a tool that we have. Jung has a quote and uh, I'm going to paraphrase it, but he says that you know, as therapists, we deal with the most unusual people who all have very peculiar understanding and no set of technique will ever really match everybody. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we teach them to look at their own nature. And so we, so then Jungian psychology uses the dream material as the voice of what's going on in the deep unconscious of mm -hmm. the individual. Then as you progress on the dream analysis, then there's a dialogue that's established. And that dialogue becomes oneoromantic. Uh, oneoromantic meaning that basically like, like you become guided in mm -hmm. your process of, uh, in your work and everything that you do. Like, you know, if you have a big lecture, usually, you know, in, in the dream will supply. I have many instances in my own practice where, you know, I, I prepare for a lecture and I got it all ready. And then, um, and then in the night I get of a dream and the next morning I rewrite my lecture mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it completely becomes something different, you know? So the, the dreams become, you know, the language between the unconscious and the conscious. It's what we talked about, you know, in terms of the sacred marriage. Yeah. How does that feel? Well, I'm amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I haven't just trying to think about where I want to go next with my next question. Um, well, first I want to say that the journey of connecting with my dreams has been I've had some extremely profound moments too. And I know I've shared with you of even having people contact me in my dreams, like my grandmother. And um, when we start to have a relationship with the dreams, it, it's extremely life-changing. And it has been for me. And I haven't even been that dedicated of a student. You know, I'm not sitting here, this, you know, claiming to be someone who is as consistent as I will be and want to be. Um, but even just knowing the power of the dreams and the little bit of work that we've done together, my dreams have changed my life. And um, one of the main things that I hope we can start talking about that was foundational for me in understanding the dream was that every person in the dream is a part of you, right? Or your psyche. Because this is where, and maybe I know you will um, yeah, yeah, dive, yeah, yeah. Yeah. dive into this, but I, I feel like that's kind of the first place where we can get caught up is thinking that, you know, someone shows up in your dream, that it is just them showing up in the dream, that it's not, it's actually not a part of yourself manifest as that person in the dream. Well, well, there's different types of dreams okay. and there's different style of interpretation. You know, Freud was very um, objective 
about dream analysis and almost literally so. And there are dreams that are literal, you know? Yeah. Like uh, Jung had one dream and, you know, where he woke up at 3.10 in the morning a day and he wrote the time down and it was a very meaningful dream. And then he found out the next day that one of his best friends had died at that time. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so there are, you know, prophetic dreams right. that announce something. And so these are very objective yes. dreams. And as you go along, you know, in your dream analysis, then you have to know, you know, the difference between an objective and a subjective approach. So the objective approach is to take it, you know, literally and concretely, you know, so-and-so came to my dreams, I'm going to see him tomorrow or something, you right. know. And, and, but, but then the subjective analysis is to look at everything as a component of my own psyche. And that becomes very archetypal. So my mother shows up in my dreams. Is it my mother or is it the great mother? Right. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at it as the great mother, then all of a sudden the meaning of the, the, meaning of the dream completely changes. Yeah. Right? So then it's the difference between a subjective and an objective perspective in dream analysis. And, you know, dreams have many, 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 the, the anticipatory, you know, they anticipate an event, they're prophetic, or uh, they, you know, I had a dream about my shadow once where my shadow, a shadow personality that kept coming back in my dream. I was, I had an, an apartment in Montreal and I had a dream series and, and, uh, where I had this place that I, anyway, I, I, I came to the apartment and there was this guy that had his own room in my apartment. And it's a shadow figure. Um, and I've seen him before in my dreams before. And, and I said, I say to him, I says, what are you doing here? This is nuts. You, you, this is my place. You can't be here. And then I had a sword. And so I challenged him to a fight. And he puts up, he pulls out a little pin. Like a, like a, you know, like a, not a push pin. Yeah, a push pin, you know, like a little, you know, tack, you know. And he, and he, and he, and he's going to fight me with that. And I look at him and I says, really? I mean, you know, and I had this, I think it was a big stick or a sword. And, and so then I lunge at him and he turns me around and he puts the pin right next to my eye. And then that's the dream. You know, so then, 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 um, you know, I had to work with that. So when you work with a dream, Jung has a series of practices that he teaches. But basically, the message to me was, if I don't deal with my shadow, it's going to blind me. Mm. I'm being blinded by my shadow. I'm not seeing things clearly. I'm not, in, you know, I haven't integrated my shadow yet. My shadow wants to be integrated. It wants to live with me. And because it's not integrated, it's threatening me to blind me. Mm. And so that was a very important message. So in that sense, the, the, the dream analysis, like the red book that Jung did, right? The red book is all the visions that he had in his dreams, that and then there's a dialogue between him and the unconscious, so he called that active imagination. But I just given you a lot there. I'll give you some time to respond. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's it's beautiful and helpful. I mean, I, I also think that as you get in relationship with your dreams, the different types of dreams have a different energy behind them. You know, like when we are talking about the prophetic dreams or the objective dreams versus these other um 
subjective dreams and the themes that can start to play out and the characters, you know, at least my experience is that there'll be periods of times where certain characters keep showing up, certain people, um, certain types of um, emotion show up in the dream, whether I'm being chased or I'm looking for something or, you know, um, you can start to track the, the themes that show up um, versus, you know, when these at least with the one with my grandmother, it was, you know, her, it's like what you said about young, her having a heart attack and contacting me in, in the middle of the night in my dream saying, I'm having a heart attack. And when I woke up in the morning, getting the call and, and, you know, my mom saying my grandmother had a heart attack last night. And I said, Oh, well, I know <laughs> she called me on the phone in my dream. Um, but for me, those dreams just felt so different you know, when they happen, there's like an eerie kind of knowing that comes with them versus these other dreams, um, this more subjective kind of connection with the unconscious. Those dreams don't have the same like intensity. Um, so I just wanted to share that with the listeners. But, you know, just a, a note on your dream, you know, you could use the, you could use a subjective form of analysis about the dream and both would be true. Right. Okay. Yes. So the subjective analysis is the grandmother being the great mother has got a broken heart. Right. Oh, right. You know, and, and then you're being, you know, because that's, you know, the, you know, the, the symbolism between a heart, with the heart, you know, with the heart attack is a heartache. You yeah. know, a lot of people die of broken hearts. Yeah. And, and, and so then, then in that, archetypal objective view that's really the nature of your calling yeah. to heal the grandmother's heart oh, yeah. so then you can use both yeah yeah thank you for speaking to that that you can take both layers to it yeah it, always always um in regards to dream you know if people are going to get in practice with their dreams what do you recommend and be, like, what if some people don't remember their dreams? Let's start well, there. Well, first, you know, in terms of the subjective and the objective, yeah, you know, the thing is that at the beginning, don't take everything too personally. You don't take everything objectively. As a rule, go subjective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you can start thinking, "Oh, my grandmother's gonna die." You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. you know, you can, you know, are you gonna say, you know, you can say things that are very damaging. Yeah. So educating yourself first of all. So your question is, how do you start a dream practice? Yeah, and also that you know, a lot of people say, and I heard someone say this to you last night. Like, I don't remember my dreams. So for those that want to even start the conversation, what does that look like? Well, it's like uh, it's like uh, it's like any practice. Huh? Do you know yoga from the time you start? Do you know? Do you know? You know, dance. Do you know? You know, music. It. it there's an education. There's an education. One of the most valuable tools I began before was uh, the artist way, mm. you know, and doing uh, morning pages on a regular basis. So the unconscious wants to know you're present. And usually if the dreams are not present, then that is um, symptomatic of the dissociation with the unconscious that is prevalent in our times. Yeah. And we have so many um, habits that prohibit an engagement yeah. with, with the dreams. One of them is, you know, pot, you yeah. know, and, and so it's very hard to dream when you're using cannabis. <laughs> and so, so if you're using any kind of substance that will affect dramatically, then there's the, you know, so then when, so then you, you very much look at it as a, as a spiritual practice. Mm. It's, it's a practice. And so, and it has a religious function to it. It's almost like a, it's, it's like a spiritual practice. It, it, y you pray for dreams, mm. like, like I, I pray for dreams and sometimes they don't come right away. Yeah. But, you know, by the journaling and by asking and, and by digging deep, sometimes they won't come right away and then boom, one comes and then you do the work. And so we'll talk a little bit more about what that work looks mm -hmm. like. 
I <clears throat> I'm working on a on a workshop series called Initiation to Dream Work that I'm hoping to release in the coming year um, about all of what we're talking about, but really laid out really well for people. But um, so the the writing practice and the being listening, you know, to what um, to the signs that are coming and to listen to the dreams. And then, uh, and, and so, you know, there's like the white noise kind of dreams. And then Jung talked about the big dreams, you know? So we have dreams and we don't really remember them. And we knew we dreamt, but we don't really remember. We looking for the dreams that have a charge mm -hmm. to them. You know, those dreams that you can't help but remember, you know, yeah. like you wake up in a cold sweat or you wake up and you go, whoa, you know, and then boom, you write it down just verbatim. Okay. That's the, that's the beginning. Yeah. I, um, I've started praying for dreams too. And also, um, sometimes I'll ask a question. I don't know how you feel about this, but I'll ask a question. And when one week I kept asking the question of like, what does my body need? Mm -hmm. Okay. So kept going to sleep before bed, you know, dream maker, what does my body need? And, uh, Okay, so I, I just want to share this dream. So one night I have this dream that I have a car and I'm, I mean, there's more pieces, but I'm just going to share this one piece right. and I'm going to gas up my car and I put the wrong fuel in my car. Okay. So, okay. It keeps going. Boom. Yeah. Okay. So it keeps going. So then I'm like freaking out because I put diesel in a gas car and I'm like, it's, it's, a, it's not going to work anymore. I screwed up my car or gas in a diesel car actually. And so then I'm like, okay. And then I call an old man, this old man shows up and I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? And he's like, well, first we got to tip the car over cause we have to dump the gas off out. So we do that. And then he goes, I just got to check something. And he puts his hand into the gas tank and he pulls out garbage, just all this garbage. Okay. So I wake up in the morning and I'm like, well, I don't know if it gets more obvious than that. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that's the first one. I'm just going to share the next one. I keep going to sleep with this dream. Right. So then in the next dream that comes through, I'm at this outdoor theater. Everyone's watching the TV, this right. big screen. Everyone's right. into this movie yeah. and everyone's eating garbage, popcorn and candy. And I'm looking around and this indigenous woman sitting beside me. And she looks at me in the eyes and she goes, you don't need that shit. You need this. And she pulls this handful of herbs. And she hands it to me. And in my dream, I remember being like, remember this, remember this. And I'm like studying this herb that's put in my hands. I'm looking at it. And then I wake up in the morning and I remember what it looks like. Cause I, in my dream, I was conscious enough to be like, remember the herb. And she said it to me in a language I didn't understand. And so I called my herbalist friend and described this herb and uh, she sends me pictures and it's cleavers. And um, anyways, we looked up cleavers and I started drinking cleavers tea that felt very... <laughs> I, I have a very similar dream where uh, many years ago I was having uh, trouble with my heart and, um, and I had this dream of this incredible, beautiful fairy-like woman visiting me and and it, it was like wow you know and it was like a heavenly you know and she was like so beautiful and it was such a incredible visit and then she starts leaving and then well well what's your name i say to her i says my name is Hawthorne. <laughs> so, so Hawthorne is a herb medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's for the heart. <laughs> it's heart medicine. Yeah. But also in Celtic lore, fairies live in Hawthorne yeah. bushes. Yeah. And, and it's a protector. It's a protector. Yeah. And I don't know if you've seen the thorns on the Hawthorne, yeah. but you don't mess with that. Yeah. It makes, uh, it makes roses, uh, you know, feel like little, you know, and, and so, <clears throat> and then I found Hawthorne bushes on the piece of land I was living. And so Hawthorne, so yes, yeah, it's very similar. Yeah.
So it's, you know, there's so much that can come from the connection, mm -hmm. right? And these are just, you know, just pieces of that work. And so writing the dreams down in the morning, as you say, this connection, conscious connection and presence with your dreams, the wanting them, the being in a space where you are present enough to receive them. Uh, and then what's next? Well, getting somebody to mentor you through the process, because it's very difficult to be objective about your own dreams. Mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of loopholes and all kinds of dangers associated with it. So getting a mentor is really important. But if you have, you know, a pretty good understanding of mythology and psychology, you know, and you've done a lot of work in, in your evolution, you, you probably can manage it. But I find that, you know, with the, the inflation that's current in our times, people think, oh, I know what my dreams mean. Mm -hmm. But um, if you dig deep enough into a dream and all of a sudden you meet your neurosis and you meet your your demons, you know, and <laughs> for that, you know, having at least initially... Having some training is really important. Jung, with all of the, with all of the, his students, he would do what was called a training analysis, and you couldn't graduate till you did a training analysis with, you know, with with one with with the, with the, with the mentor, and in that you really got to, you know, it was a lengthy analysis where you got to make peace with your demons. Mm. And then you were ready to go and to do work with others. Right. So that's what I want to do. I want to do the initiation to dream work, six. And then I want to do, uh, you know, a training analysis with people. Uh, that's part of the Healer and the Dreamer astrology course. And it's interesting, huh? The synchronicity between dream and and astrology is fascinating. Um, and we'll talk more about that. So then there, there are <clears throat> practices, you know, this is, there are different aspects to dream analysis. And the most important thing to remember is one, the big dreams, and two, it's a practice. It, you, the dreams, there's a quote that I really like, and again, I'm going to paraphrase it, where Jung talks about how dreams, you know, like one dream and then the next dream and the next dream, the dream sequence is a cohesive dialogue. You don't take one dream, and if you misunderstand that dream, the next dream will clarify it. And the next dream after that will add to it. And sometimes you have repeating patterns, right? Mm -hmm. That's because you haven't gotten it yet. Mm -hmm. So it keeps repeating itself till you get it, and then it stops repeating itself. So recurring dreams are just because you're not getting the message, therefore it keeps coming back. Mm -hmm. so, so, so then the dreams sequence... So it's a, it's a practice, and the more religious you are about it, the more you're going to get out of it, and you can <clears throat> resolve, you know, you know, psychopathology, you know, it's difficult, you know, if one is a psychopath, you know, but Jung had some very, very difficult clients that he was able to cure through dream analysis. Uh, it... it, it it requires a tremendous amount of effort on the therapist's side to go with someone that's very ill like that. And, you know, there may be cases that are uncurable, but like the common day neurosis, you know, the, the you know, with the, you know, the latent psychosis that um, that's current in our times um, can be greatly helped and if not completely cured. Mm. Um, and... I have myself, you know, and, and others, you know, to testify to how powerful uh, a dream practice can be in your healing process. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to um, this? You've mentioned it a couple of times, like the inflation and this psychosis, like collective psychosis. Can you speak 
briefly well, that's to that? A, that's a that's a door that opens a hallway with mm. many other doors. Yeah. And so if we go down that hallway, we're gone. <laughs> well, we're going to be in that hallway. And 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 so I can it, it's it's um I mean we could you know go we, we've talked about this before sublimation and the, the dangers that yeah. are that 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 come into work and then there's the transference and yeah. you know that we encounter as therapists that are 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 very difficult places and so they you know that's why you shouldn't go with this alone because you can go down a rabbit hole and end up you know with the uh, with the queen of hearts saying off with your head, you know, and, and it becomes, you know, it can be very, if you have a latent psychosis, if you have, you know, difficult issues, um, to, that you want to overcome, then get some, get somebody that can help you through that because right. the images can be terrifying and you can become very vulnerable. And that's part of why some people don't dream, you know, because, you know, the dreams they have are just terrifying, you know? Right. Well, I think when we use words like psychosis, um, and such like people often will be like, Oh, I don't identify with that at all. Right. Cause we've been in the medical system and in the ways I think that you use the terms are just used differently where, you know, when we're talking about the sublimation or this inflation, it's a sneaky bitch for one. And <laughs> I, you know, like that process is a sneaky bitch. We have a collective dissociation happening, um, where we're, uh, many of us are, are, um, dissociating from, our souls and our conscious, um, presence in our lives. And, um, I guess I just want to speak to that as when we are doing the dream work, you know, as you said, it can be intense and disturbing. And there's a reason why people avoid this type of work because we do need to have mentors and therapists to usher us into that. But I think first is the acceptance that many of us actually are dissociated. Many of us actually are unwell, um, even if we don't identify as being like medically mentally ill. Um, there's patterns going on where we are, when we are doing a small amount of work, we're inflating it in this way of like, oh, look, I'm doing all this work. I'm doing everything I should in this way of really, we're just like upkeeping this image versus actually diving in to the uncomfortable parts of ourselves, the uncomfortable traits that we have, the ancestral, like you speak to ancestral rage, the ancestral trauma. Um, a lot of the things that we're doing are things to actually help us avoid this this shit, <laughs> not actually bringing us into it. Right. And so I just wanted to speak to that because dream work is the opposite of that. It is not a practice that's going to keep the gate closed. Whereas I see people using things like yoga, even meditation, art, whatever it is to actually keep the fucking devil behind the gate <laughs> and to also be able to keep an image of being someone who is spiritually progressive and doing the work. That's what I wanted to speak to. Well, yeah. we're we're three doors down on the on, <laughs> on the hallway already. But just to, to like kind of put a loop on it and to you know tie up and go back go to back. the dream yes. analysis. But uh, you know, I think that it's very clearly that we live in a psychopathic society. Yeah, our leaders are psychopaths. We are rushing towards destruction at 150 miles an hour. And we are living in drastic times. And if you live in a time of collective psychosis, chances are you're psychotic yourself and you don't even know it because right. you think you're normal. <laughs> right. right? If you're normal, that may in a psychopathic society means you're, you know, so, 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 so Liz Green says something beautiful. She says, you know, to, 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 to go sane feels a lot like going crazy. Right. Because once we start doing the work, then we start not identifying with the collective psychosis anymore. And then that's very isolating. All of a sudden we feel alone and we feel like we're the one who are crazy. Mm -hmm. But it's the society that's crazy and you're becoming sane. And that's the first challenge that we have is to stop identifying with the psychosis 
and to actually become sane, that's a lot of work. Yeah. And dream analysis is chief, but also all of your spiritual practices, um, your writing practice, the artist way, so important because she teaches you, you know, to, to, to develop your personality. And so that's what Jung talked about. Is he talked about the development of personality, using tools to develop yourself as a means of overcoming the collective psychosis. Mm -hmm. We identify with the collective then we're neurotic and psychotic in our behavior and we're all over the place and we have mental illness. Yeah. And then, you know, and it's a mental illness, you know, epidemic. By developing the personality, strengthen the ego, strengthen who you are, a sense of self, then you become immune to the collective psychosis, mm -hmm. then you become a real person. Right. And then that individuality is the medicine for the time of collective psychosis. Beautiful. Beautiful. And you know, when you see people that are doing that, they're the anchor, right? And everyone knows you have someone in your life who is developing their personality and they're like the, the beaming light that, you know, maybe it's hard to see them not conforming or whatever, but they end up being the anchor of like, oh shit, that person's doing whatever the fuck they want. It's like, <laughs> it's, a, it's when you see someone that's free yeah. to actually free mm -hmm. that power, that personality affects you. Yeah. And, and Jung says, you know, it doesn't matter what you say. It's what you do that matters. And if you're a person, there's no fooling another person to think I've become a personality. <laughs> you know, if you're a cardboard, you know, and you say all the right things and we can, you know, parrot, you know, all the right things to say, you know, you just, you know, follow Instagram enough. You'll know, you know, the collective superficial wisdom, but to actually walk the talk. Oh, and when you walk to talk, then you don't have to say anything. <laughs> and that's what we were talking about today. Yeah. Didn't we? Yeah. Um, coming back to the dream work, you know, in like pop culture dream analysis, there's like the books with the symbols, like, oh, if this happens in your dream, it means this. And so I know from working with you, there's like a mixed method of like certain, like the symbology of things and also the association that you have to it. Is right. that right? So can you talk a bit about that? Well, so, so Jung talked about the tools. So there's a technique, but he says, first thing is you learn your technique and then you throw your technique away because it's about the relationship with the client. Mm -hmm. And what, and it doesn't matter if you know what the dream means, really. What matters is the person that you're helping understands what their dream is saying. And if they understand, it may not be what you understand. Yeah. Because the dream will mean something to you and it will mean something to your client. So being very objective and detached and to allow the unconscious to speak to the process. We want to know what the dream is saying and you got to come in at it with the blank slate. Mm. And when you hear the dream, you resist the temptation of knowing mm -hmm. because that's the greatest disservice you do to your client is to know. Yeah. They, it's what doesn't matter if you know. It's your client that wants to develop a relationship with her, her, her or his unconscious and that's what the main task is. So, in conf so then the structures to the dream. Usually the initial sentence, the initial couple of sentences set the scene and tell you what the dream's about. And then there's the progression and there's the conclusion. It's like, a, it's like when you study fairy tales, you know. So Jung says you want to develop a good practice, read fairy tales and practice understanding fairy tales and myths and religious myths 
you just have to. And if you're doing work with some a Persian person, you should know Persian mythology. If you're doing work with the uh, Irish, you should know Celtic mythology. Mm. So then the more you can educate yourself in Greek mythology, Hindu mythology, the more mythology you read and learn to understand them uh, symbolically. Mm. So dreams speak the same language as fairy tales and mythology. They speak a symbolic language. So the language of symbol is a different language than the language, rational language that we use. So then we're seeing, Jung says, you should look as a dream as a sacred ancient text that you're trying to look at and you're trying to figure out what is it saying. So you should have that same kind of attitude with the dream. And so when you look at the dream, you write it all down and you're beginning with the beginning and you go through the process and you resist the temptation to say, oh, I know what it means. Mm -hmm. And, and so this is the science of it. The science of it's very simple. Symbols, what are symbols? Understanding the language of symbols. How you understand the language of symbols? That's the same technique we use when we do astrology. It's called amplification and free association. So you take the symbols as they're presented in order of the dream and you look, okay? So usually I'm in the house. I'm in my grandmother's house, okay? So take that and you amplify it. What? So you make it really big. What's my grandmother's house? So now you associate with that. So free associate with grandmother's house. Mm. What does it Fam feel? Fa um, family. family. Family, where my mom grew up. What's your relationship with grandma? Right. Well, how does she mean to you? What does right. she mean to you? Oh, it wasn't my favorite place. I'm just pretending, but yes. Not, let's, yeah. I'm not, you know, yeah. and, and uh, I, you know, I hate my grandmother or, yeah. you know, so, yeah, I, so, so there's association. Okay? I see, yeah. So, so, so then... We're in my grandmother's house that comes as initial statement. Who's the grandmother? Right. So we already talked about that. Like could that be the great, great mother. The great mother, yeah. So but it's also an ancestor. Right. So I used to go to grandma's house and she used to make me uh, she used to make uh, raisin bread and homemade peanut butter. And I love going to my grandmother just because she would give me hot milk with uh, nutmeg and peanut butter raisin toast. And like to this day, you know, so, so, then, so then you're associating with what it means. So this dream, so if it's in the initial statement, then it's in the ancestral home and, and the grandmother, it's also the great mother. Mm -hmm. So this dream is about your ancestral connection and your childhood, you know? And so then, the, so the theme, so then we progress through, let's would see. You, would you bring in like the fact, the fact, like say it was a positive place, like you were just explaining that there would be kind of benevolent feelings about that home. That would also be part of the... The yeah. dream analysis. Like let's the, let's use a let's use a real dream. Okay, okay. Let's you. No, I'm going to use a, a dream um, that Jung tells the first dream. So Jung had a, a dream when he was four years old, and it marked him, and he couldn't talk about it. The first time he talked about it with someone was with his wife after he was sixty years old. Okay. Uh, you know, and he had it when he was four years old, and ten. ten Tendency is that the dreams that come early in life are prophetic in terms of... So, so he's in the backyard of his house exploring as a four-year-old. And he comes to a trap door. 
in, in the ground. And he opens the trap door and he sees stairs and he goes down the stairs and he comes to a green, rich brocade, thick, thick curtain and he opens it and it gives way to a big temple room with, with, a, with an altar and a statue on the altar that looks like it's made out of flesh and it's got one eye at the top. Then he hears his mother say, take a very good look, that's the man-eater. The man-eater? Mm-hmm. So that's a famous Jung dream. Okay. So then we take it and we start Okay, so he's exploring the trap door. His, his, his life is to explore the unconscious, mm -hmm. right? So right. he goes into the unconscious right. and the green brocade curtain is nature, mm. right? Opens and he sees the, the subterranean temple with the Shiva Lingam. A big penis with the symbol, you know, and that, you know, of, 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 of creativity, masculine creativity in many, many, you know, like we got the maple, we got, you know, the Shiva Lingam, we got, you know, all, you know, the, you know, when we do the maple dance, we're turning, we're dancing around a penis. And, you know, it's, you know, this, this, these are, you know, they used to, they used to be everywhere, you right. know? Right. So some of these are cultural, like when you're speaking to that, that's like a cultural symbol, right. like mythic symbol that, so sometimes, you know, those things come up and it's quite clear what it is and you know things like the basement like the trap door to the basement or the forest or um, going into the forest like those represent the unconscious and so there's there's some pieces that are kind of consistent throughout the dreams right yes yes and 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 you know you you will look at a dream and you won't understand it because you don't understand the makeup of the ancestral line of the individual right so then a lot of dreams, you'll have to do some work. You'll have to ask questions. You'll have to try to find mm -hmm. out, you know. And so, you know, there's lots of, of instances of that. But to finish, you know, his mother says, take a very good look at it. That's the man eater. And when, you know, so this is a four-year-old child. And his father was a, was a, a, a parson. In, in 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 the Swiss Reformed Church, and uh, they he used to do um, um, he used to do burials, and his son would look, and they would put men into the ground, so the earth would eat the men, mm. the man eater, and then they used to be Jesuit priests, and he used to be afraid of the Jesuit priest. And, and as they were man-eaters, because they would only show up during those kind of events. Right. So then, so his childhood was, was marked with the darkness of this whole concept of Judeo-Christian that, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. And so then here we have, in a nutshell, what Jung's life meant is the deciphering of pagan cults and the, the, the Christianity, you know, one of the greatest tasks that Jung did is he helped us redefine what Christianity was about mm. and as a process of individuation. And he reframed the symbolism of Christianity to explain the process of individuation. Not only that, but he found the roots of Christianity and explored the roots. Um, if you're fascinated with that kind of stuff, um, one of the fabulous, fabulous books uh, in the collective works is um, uh, Psychology and Religion, Volume 11. Mm -hmm. um, Psychology and Religion is like, you know, like like uh, 
like establishing the mass as a shamanic ritual of the highest order mm -hmm. and what it means and what happens to it and how we do the same thing when we do our shamanic rituals. Yeah. We're, we're actually, you know, this is, this is as ancient as time. Yeah. And, and then, uh, and then, uh, if I may, uh, apotropaic. Yeah. That word apotropaic, it, it, these are it, apotropaic, is, is, is a ritual that heals the soul. And we were talking about, you know, psychopathy and, and, and psychosis and, and, and mental illness. Mental illness, you know, so if you take psychological, psyche is soul. To Jung, psychology was the science of the soul. And a psychopath is someone whose soul is sick. And uh, neurosis in the psychopathology is the soul asking to be healed. Mm -hmm. And so the symptoms are to be associated, you know, seen symbolically. And through the dream analysis, we can discover the root of the mental illness. Mm -hmm. And by doing the work, we can integrate that back into our personality and that's the development of personality that the neurosis is the part of myself that's unconscious that one that's pulling at me and wants to be integrated yeah so that that little child who loved the peanut butter bread you know that want that joyful child wants to be integrated back into consciousness and it'll show up in the dream of the grandmother, mm, you know? Beautiful. So yeah. does that make sense? It does. And I'm actually just thinking of our time because you have some readings coming up here, but um, I was thinking maybe it would be great for us to do a little video or something where we do a little dream analysis. Um, well, that's the, the six. Um, that's already what you're going to do. That's, you yeah. know, we want to go really deep into it and then uh, do uh, do some fairy tales because there's, so um, we could do um, a cute little fairy tale to end with. Okay. We or have a we little do. bit of time. We're well, unless you have something else. No, no. Let's close up. We have 15 minutes till your person's coming. So. 15 minutes till my first reading. Yeah. Okay. So the princess and the ball. Yeah. Okay. You know, princess and the ball. No. The princess and the ball is from, um, um, Germanic roots. It's, um, a Grimm brother story. Okay. It's a, it's, we know this is a story. So really fast forward. So we have the little princess who's got her ball and her ball is a favorite plaything, and she throws her ball up in the air and she runs and she catches it. And then she's playing by the forest and she throws her ball and it falls into the well. And she goes ballistic, screams, my ball, my ball, my ball. The frog shows up. He says, I can go get your ball. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Under one condition. You have to take me home with you. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I'll take you home with me. So the frog jumps into the well, gets the ball out. The little girl catches her ball and ditches. She runs away. And the frog's saying, hey, you promised. And shoo, she's gone. The next day, they're having lunch with the king and the queen, and there's a knocking at the door. Boom, boom, boom. The little girl goes, answers the door, and there's the frog there. And the frog says, hey, man, you just promised you were going to take me home with you. The little girl says, you're going to get me into so much trouble. This is awful. You're a frog. I'm a princess. This is a no-go, dude. Get out of here. Slams the door. The next evening, they're having supper. Bam, bam, bam at the door. The little girl goes, you're going to get me in trouble. And then her father shows up. And the father says, so what's this? And um, the frog tells the story and the father looks at the little girl and says, is this true? And she says, yeah, well, you're a princess. If you're not going to grow into a queen, you have to honor your word. Take the frog. He's having dinner with us. 
So she picks up the frog <laughs> and brings the frog over, and the frog sits next to her, and he's eating her his peas, and 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 uh, and the princess is grossed out, and uh, the princess says, "Can I be excused, Daddy? I don't feel well." And then, and then uh, the father says, sure. And the frog says, take me with you. And then the little girl, do I have to? And the father looks at her seriously. So she, this time she puts the frog on the cushion so she doesn't have to touch it. And she brings her home uh, into this, her room and she puts him on a little stool. And the frog says, no, dude, I'm sleeping in your bed. What? There's no way. So she grabs the frog by the legs and spins him and spins him and spins him and dashes him on the rocks. And there's a big cloud of smoke. And when the smoke settles, there's a prince. And she goes, oh. And so then, yeah, they become happily ever after. So... That's really tells about the process of individuation. The ball is a symbol of individuation. And it falls into the unconscious, the well, and the shadow goes and gets it. So the shadow is the key to the process of individuation. We have to integrate the shadow. The shadow says, I'll give you your ball. You can become individuated, but you got to take me home with you. Right. And then, but there's the resistance we all have. No fucking way I want to deal with my shadow. But then, knock, and then sacred masculine, the father says, you got to become whole. You got to face your shadow. And then there's a confrontation with the shadow. Yeah, but she throws him out the window. Well, but that confrontation, the process of individuating is violent. It's very <laughs> difficult. Right. It's the confrontation with the shadow is a battle. Okay. And out of that battle comes the... And now the shadow turns into a prince. Right. He was cursed. You know, so the curse means that the shadow is the part of our unconscious. That's the prince. Yeah. But it's repressed and not being given a voice. So it's turned into a frog by the old witch. Right. Ancestral trauma. I guess we got to let it sleep in our bed. We got to embrace the shadow. <laughs> and when we embrace the shadow, then we become whole. Right. So that's fairy tales all have a myth underneath them that is symbolic. Yeah. And we can look at it and we can disnify the, the story or we can, you know, like Cinderella, you know, the Cinderella, if you read it from the Grimm Brothers, it's brutal. Mm -hmm. We'll tell that story another time. <laughs> um, thank you, Martin. And I know I will, at least in my show, I'll put the show notes um, where to reach you, where to reach your channel um, for my listeners. And, um, you know, I'm so grateful. And this is just scratching the surface. And for those that are interested in continued study with you or mentorship with you, can connect with you with the information down low, below. Um, and yeah, thank you for this conversation. Great honor. That was fun. <laughs> whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> we'll catch you next time. <laughs>